Start your engines. The way it was in 92, Nigel Mansell, Formula One world champion. A record number of wins, pole positions and fastest laps throughout the season. And naturally the achievement was celebrated in style with his family at home on the Isle of Man. But for 1993, a new challenge. Nigel and his famous Red Five transferred to the USA. It's history now that the triumphs continued in another season of success. Amazing that after 12 years in the higher echelons of motor racing, Nigel hadn't won a title, though he'd come so close on three occasions. Now he'd won twice in succession, but incredibly in different championships. More people have got in touch, more people have sent congratulatory telegrams and faxes and I think um, it's just excited a lot more people to the fact that it's just an incredible set of circumstances and doing it back to back. The men behind the arrival of Nigel Mansell, Paul Newman and Karl Haas. They were responsible for bringing off the remarkable coup. When Michael Andretti left for Formula One, Newman Haas went for the very best and got him. Nigel's initial outing with his new team was at the Phoenix Firebirds circuit, where with Greg Norman for company, he first tested the abilities of a hired Cadillac. Greg Norman and Nigel have been great friends for years. Given a choice, Nigel would have loved to have become open golf champion. Greg would gladly swap his title for a run in Red 5. Nigel's Newman Haas Lola with a Ford engine is built along classic racing lines at Lola's factory in Huntingdon in England. Unlike Formula One, IndyCar engines are turbocharged. They accelerate up to 100 miles an hour in four seconds without the aid of automatic gearboxes, active suspensions and traction control. It's a driver's formula. Over the years, it's been proved that the experienced have an advantage in a series contested on road and street circuits, super speedways and ovals. Five different drivers had won the championship in the previous five seasons, all of them after at least five years of IndyCar racing. History was against Nigel Mansell. Hey, Jim. Oh, Jerry. For Nigel, the pre-season was to be an important period of acquaintance not just with the car, but also with his new team. And it soon became apparent the new boy was settling in well. Even though Nigel had moved from Formula One to Indy cars as champion, there was never any guarantee that success would be automatic. It's rare for a Formula One driver to make any impression in his first season after crossing over. Nigel rounded off his first session in an Indy car with a spectacular demonstration of spins. It was a lot heavier, um, it wasn't as nimble as a Formula One car, but everything else was the same, the cockpit. Um, you know, the feeling, the realisation of going quick and um, stopping was a little bit slower, but in some regard, that was even more exciting because you didn't know whether you are going to make the corner or not. Nigel's application and thorough determination impressed everyone. Carl Haas knew that the next real test was how Nigel adapted to driving on an oval. And that was next on the agenda. 
racing on ovals has remained essentially an American occupation. European drivers have little chance to experience and master the techniques required. The Phoenix International Raceway in Arizona deserted except for the Newman Haas crew and a few members of the media. And for some of them, particularly those from Britain, this was a whole new experience too. Paul Newman, one of the interested onlookers in the crowd on Pitt Road. Even hand-timed, Nigel's laps were quick, the unofficial lap record broken. So the boss, apparently impressed with the progress being made. The signs were certainly good. The competition had better beware. Nigel's initial outing cemented the foundations of a solid professional relationship within the team. Less than a month away from the first race, everything according to plan. Well, he's, uh, you know, everything I thought he'd be. I mean, he's a world champion and uh, he's got a lot of experience. Uh, you know, he just, uh, he understands the race cars and, you know, you can just tell immediately by his technique on the racetrack and the way he feels things and his comments that uh, he's really a professional and, uh, you know, I'm really pleased and uh, anxious to uh, get on with the season. And the first race of the season, not in the USA, but overseas in Queensland on Australia's Gold Coast. And the first task, not to snatch a glimpse of the unfamiliar circuit, but to talk to the assembled masses of the world's media. An unprecedented amount of interest in an IndyCar race, and just one reason for that. Nigel Mansell, back in Australia, where he'd rounded off his Formula One career five months earlier in Adelaide. Now he was here again, in a country where he was so popular. And everyone, it seemed, wanted to extend an invitation to the new world champion. Well, hello and welcome to Australia. Here we are outside SeaWorld, and I want you to join me to do something very special I've never done before in my life. Come inside with me and see what I'm talking about. Now, living in Florida these days, Nigel's well acquainted with the Miami Dolphins. In Queensland, he met the real thing. Do they call them a school of dolphins? Well, it was Nigel that did most of the learning. On the rocket ride first. Spike Pierce, the dolphin trainer. He shows how it's done. Oh, look at that. Oh, yes. Hey, you didn't know I was going in for stunt training. Let's see you do that one. Hey, let's see me do that one, right? Hey, hey, boys, be kind to me. Oh, you can have some more fish. Yes, you can. There you go. Hey, now, what are you going to do when you get on them? Yeah. You're going to both there and lean right for it. Okay. Don't go head first into them. Lean forward. <laughs> How was that for the first attempt? Yeah. <laughs> oh boy, oh boy. Hey, uh, they're coming home with me, they don't know it yet. Hey, handsome. How you doing, hey? Hey, how you doing? What do you think of that then? Hey, hey, what do you think of that then? Oh yeah, yeah, that's great, yeah! Roseanne Mansell, infinitely more graceful in the water than husband Nigel. Yeah, fantastic or what? Is that the best thing you've ever done? Yeah. And finally, this one strictly for the experts. Not as quick as the Lola, but probably just as much fun. Look at him. Hi, hi, how you doing? Shake hands then. Thank you very much indeed, thank you. <laughs> oh dear, you want to come home with me? You don't want to stay here, do you? Hey, what do you think? Hey, that's the most unbelievable, fantastic thing I've ever done in my life. 
and equal to winning any Grand Prix in the world. I mean, look at this. Absolutely beautiful. And you didn't realize, but when I'm retiring from IndyCar racing, hi, handsome, <laughs> I'm gonna go for an assistant trainer's job. <laughs> Everyone in the whole of the IndyCar series pleased at last to be down to real work on the track instead of the endless hours of testing on lonely circuits. Now to see just how valuable the pre-season had been. And for Nigel, a chance to compare notes with Mario Andretti. In 1980, Nigel made his Formula One debut with Lotus at the Österreich Ring with Mario as team leader. The car, transported over from the States, reassembled in the pit garage and fired up ready for action. Cars have individual characters and temperaments. They might be perfect one day and not so good the next. A driver notices the differences immediately. At Surface Paradise, this Red 5 was not yet quite in race order for Nigel. A few slight adjustments required before it was ready to run. Clutch pedal's a lot further back in this one. If you can move the clutch pedal you know, about an eighth of an inch forward and move the stop another eighth of an inch forward. Okay, yeah, we so, can do that. Uh, no, that's good, that's all we can do. Sorry. I'm on the spin. Hi, good morning. <laughs> I'm going to let you all know, I am absolutely shattered. Don't tell anyone, but that dolphin ride yesterday almost broke my back. <laughs> Hello Tom, you didn't hear that, did you? Mate? <laughs> I'd just like at this point to introduce you to Tom. He's my chief mechanic of the car. This is Tom, say hello to all the viewers there. Good morning. He was going to shake the camera. Yeah, yeah. he was. <laughs> I didn't want really to do it. <laughs> I'm a rookie at this. Just uh, what I'd like to do, I'd like Tom now to introduce the other men on the uh, T-car and the race car, and if you'd like to do that to camera, I'd be grateful. Okay. This is Jerry Bouchard. He's uh, one of the front end men. Lynn. This is Lynn Ostergaard. He does the back end. There you go. This here is Ray Sorensen. How you doing? He does uh, the back end of uh, the uh, second car. Excuse me. This is Tim Coffeen. He does the front end. This is Dan Tolberg. He does all our electronics on all four cars. This is this is Trev Weston. He doing? does the gearboxes. How you doing? For a while at Surfers Paradise, rain stopped play, a situation not unknown to the Gold Coast's most famous Englishman, Barry Sheen. Delighted to see Nigel in Indy cars. Oh, I think it's tremendous impact, you know, it do the race a hell of a lot of good, especially here, you know, because Nigel uh, uh, has a great following here because there's a large sort of English population. But I think worldwide, you know, the television rights have sort of all of a sudden become interesting for people and it can only do the sport a lot of good. Obviously, biasly, I'd like to see Nigel win it, you know, because he's my mate. On the other hand, I'd like to see Emerson win it as well, you know, but I think it'd do the sport a tremendous amount of good if uh, Nigel won first time out.
Okay, well I have the great pleasure now of introducing you to my engineer for the year, Peter Gibbons. These are all the viewers back home in Europe. And uh, Peter is basically responsible for the whole engineering of uh, Red 5. It is very, very impressive uh, how much work is being done. I mean, a lot was taken for granted in Formula 1, uh, especially with the active program, because of course you didn't have all these uh, different rockers and springs and bump rubbers and, and that and now coming back to this it actually means a lot more work i mean uh, quite quite impressive gearbox has just gone back on again uh, mainly because uh, i blame it on my thumb today but i've uh, taken the corners off some gears again but uh, we're really thrilled i think peter's quite happy we've, we've made some good progress and peter and i together have been very brave uh, from the standpoint we're making major changes again with the car tonight for tomorrow. Now, it might well be that it will be the wrong avenue to go down, but I can't tell you specifically what we're doing with the springs, but we're changing the springs, we're changing the aerodynamics, and we're changing a lot of other things as well. No standing starts in IndyCar racing, it's a rolling start. It takes a special technique, the pace car peels off, Nigel's lack of IndyCar experience told. He'd been caught unawares and was immediately demoted to third. Fittipaldi first, Tracy second. Then in a daring move, Robbie Gordon dived down the inside and Nigel had dropped back another place. But not for long. Mansell gave chase and was soon all over the Californian. There's no finer street racer and Gordon soon had to give way to Red 5. In the pits, team manager Jim McGee was in radio contact with the car and able to discuss strategy with the driver and crew members. Mansell was on a big charge. After 15 laps, only fitter Pauldy ahead of him. Nigel challenging. Brakes locked up, Mansell passed Fittipaldi to take the lead, but unbeknown to Nigel, a yellow flag was out, making overtaking illegal. He was ordered into the pits for a stop-and-go penalty. The team manager quick to respond. Cleverly, the team uses the stop-and-go penalty to change tyres, which were damaged in the manoeuvre. Mansell soon back into the action. Fittipaldi and Gordon screamed into the pits together for tyres and fuel. By lap 30, Mansell had worked his way back to fourth, but Fittipaldi still led. After Fittipaldi made his second pit stop on lap 45, Mansell went to the front and had time to discuss the situation with Jim McGee in the pits. Because of his enforced early pit stop, Mansell's refueling was out of sequence with the other teams. He'd already changed tyres at a second stop, so this, the third, was what's called a splash and dash, putting in just enough fuel to reach the end of the race. Nigel rejoined, still leading, but in the closing stages, the gap to fit Apaldi, who was charging in second, narrowed to just five seconds. But Nigel hung on. After 65 tough and torrid laps, he took the chequered flag. It had been a close run thing. His car spluttered to a halt out of fuel. Once again, Mansell writing the headlines. I mean, I wanted to be competitive and I was motivated because I never actually had won in Australia before in my Formula One career. So to sit on the pole and win the race uh, in Australia in the opening event was just... Uh, something very special again and then of course I don't know what the historical things are uh, in IndyCar and then to be told it would made history as well was even extra special again. After the stunning victory at surface back to the States for his first race on an oval. <laughs> the girl, huh? Yeah, see you on race day, Nigel. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> you should be embarrassed. Oh my god. <laughs>
<laughs> you want to, you want to see what I've written? <laughs> oh, it's a phone number. <laughs> <laughs> Phoenix looks a small and demanding track, a simple four-turn, one-mile oval. But it's caught out experienced drivers in the past and needs to be treated with respect. It's like going around Monte Carlo, whereby you make the slightest mistake, you get penalised for it. But at Monte Carlo, your penalty is normally a broken wheel. Your penalty here is 180 mile an hour in a concrete wall. Nigel had tested at Phoenix earlier in the year when there was no opposition alongside. This was going to be different. The times were encouraging, the car was running well. Nigel in excellent form again. But then it happened. The impact was immense. At 180 miles an hour, the car had snapped out of control, careered towards the wall and punched a gaping hole in the concrete. The safety crew was on the scene in seconds, carefully extricating the unconscious Mansell from the tangled wreckage. Anxious faces, just yards from the scene. After half an hour, Nigel was on a stretcher to be taken by ambulance to the helicopter and whisked away to hospital. After such a massive crash, the atmosphere around Phoenix that day was subdued. Concern for the champion mixed with disbelief that it had happened to him. The initial diagnosis was concussion and severe bruising. Room 732's famous patient at the hospital was a subject of continual inquiries from the press and the fans. Roseanne dealt with them all with quiet assurance. In the room, Nigel was in pain. Only later was the full extent of his back injury discovered. But he was keen to reassure everyone he'd be OK. I feel very disappointed. Um, it goes without saying we've had a massive trauma up the spine and my shoulder here is swelling up uh, quite big. I've um, got quite a headache. Unfortunately not through one of celebration and drink but uh, just the impact and concussion which is normal. You feel a little bit nausea which is normal again. But I think we'll, we'll be up and running within hopefully a, a few days. And, We'll be uh, looking forward very much, of course, to, to Long Beach in two weeks' time. The following day, as teammate Mario Andretti was winning his first race for five years, Nigel was on his way home. Should be at the racetrack, as you know. But we're just about to fly off uh, back to Florida. Hopefully by mid-afternoon I'll be being readmitted to hospital. I've got a problem with my lower back. It's one of those things, I'm afraid. I'm told that every driver's been in the wall there. And it's just unfortunate that I've joined the club a bit earlier than I'd anticipated. It just goes to show how quickly an oval can bite you, and uh, it bit me real good. And you know, everybody knows the result. I was uh, knocked unconscious for some time, and uh, I basically split my back internally open, and. Uh, Everybody knows what happened after that, and it put me out that weekend, and uh, I struggled then for two to three months to even get back. Well, the reality was that you were hurt far worse than you let on, or perhaps even your doctors let on. Well, I mean, that was necessary because uh, with the insurance problems here in America, um, if people would have known that I was actually driving uh, with massive internal bleeding, um, I think anybody in their right mind would have stopped me. And it was necessary from the championship point of view to carry on driving, at least to sort of try and get some special points. And, you know, that leads us on to Long Beach, and getting through the Long Beach weekend was uh, was incredible. Did it affect your confidence level at all? Oh, yeah. I mean, for sure. I mean, it knocked me for six. I mean, Payne's a, a great confidence <laughs> knocker. And, um, you know, I mean, whatever happened at Phoenix, whether it was my mistake, the car's mistake, the accident happened, and I'm the, I'm the guy in the car, um, it took a lot to bounce back from. Bouncing back, not recommended by the doctors, but incredibly, he did. 
Long Beach, a Formula One venue until 1984. Nigel raced there three times, but the circuit had changed since it was known as California's Monte Carlo. Though there are still some reminders of the old days around the harbour. The cockpit of Red 5 was specially padded to make the ride more comfortable, but it also made the fit tighter. Not ideal circumstances to attempt a flying lap of a bumpy, torturous circuit like Long Beach, but Nigel was game. The Penske's were proving to be a force again. Tracy quicker than Fittipaldi. Nigel, meanwhile, off on a real flyer. A new qualifying lap record in his sights. Long Beach, 1.6 miles, nine turns. Reminiscent of Monaco in parts, Adelaide in others. Even the old Birmingham, though there are no palm trees on Bristol Street. Coming out of the corner of the hairpin. Vitally important. Coming out first, second, third, under the Toyota Bridge. Now we're approaching 180 miles an hour in fifth gear, keeping to the right and now accelerating down the main straight, probably approaching 190, braking real hard now, second gear, slinging it in, look how close to the wall, second, coming round again, sliding a little bit under steer, third gear, down to second again, round the right hander, front wheel almost kissing the wall, and this is very important through here now, slingshotting through, bit of oversteer coming out there, third, fourth gear, fifth, we're already up to 180 miles an hour again, and coming down the back straight, braking very hard here into the second gear right hander, few bumps here, round the corner, and now drifting, getting over to the other side, swinging it left, keeping it on its nose now, keeping it left, down to second, down to first, round the hairpin, kicking out, look how close to the wall, first, second, third, feeling very quick at this point, and just hoping and hoping that it's just a bit quicker than a 53 second, and as you can see, I've already slowed down to catch my breath. 52.9, 108 miles an hour pole position again. I was in a lot of discomfort. I was being drained off twice a day. That's to say needles were being punched into my back and we're draining off uh, upwards of half a pint to a pint of fluid uh, you know every day and and I must confess now that on Saturday and Sunday uh, I had neat anesthetic pumped into the bottom of my back to just make it completely numb. Uh, but that was a problem. It was a good thing from the point of view of pain and I could then drive the car the problem was I couldn't feel the car because the whole lower part and, and the one time the actual numbness came down to my knees. So from my knees upwards probably into my chest I couldn't feel any part of my back or, or bottom and therefore all the bumps and sensations that were coming through the car I couldn't feel them. In the 105 lap race Paul Tracy was away to a good start and led after the early stages trading places with Nigel throughout the race. Then on lap 53, Alan Sir Jr., a four times winner at Long Beach, started to close on red five. Even in the confines of a street race, this was a mistake that shouldn't have happened. Unser, though, paid the penalty. Nigel's rear wing was damaged, but Unser retired with a broken front suspension. It was back to a two-way tussle for the lead between Mansell and Tracy but less than 20 laps to go, and suddenly Nigel was in trouble again as Emerson Fittipaldi slipped past. Mansell dropped back. Mansell dropped back. Problems with the car ruined the chance of a grandstand finish. I've lost power. I've lost power, Emma. You have no power? This is not the With five laps to go, Nigel was running 20 seconds off the lead and only a yellow flag could help him challenge Tracy and Bobby Rahal. It didn't happen. Tracy pulled off his first ever victory with Rahal second and Nigel third.
third at Long Beach, good enough to give Nigel the championship lead, though, over his teammate Mario Andretti, with another ex-Formula One driver, Tio Fabi of Italy, now third in the standings. And after Long Beach, I came back and I had uh, drain uh, pipes put in my back again, two of them in fact, so I had something like about 20 inches of pipe internally in my back, draining it off to try and seal it down. And unfortunately I had a big uh, abscess uh, that then um, happened in my back, which was about this big, uh, 10 inches by 8. Um, and uh, then we got a second opinion and went up to uh, Terry Trammell in Indianapolis and have another different type of CAT scan. And that showed this huge void I had in the, the base of my back by the bottom of my spine, which was a big pouch, um, where it showed that the, all the tissues were torn apart. The whole skin bone was put torn away from the bone and, and muscle. He had a serious injury. Um, he had a lot of conservative treatment to, ki to try and get over that. Uh, we did everything we could to avoid surgery, but it got to the point that if he uh, were going to have a chance to race at Indy and to continue the race season, uh, he, he had to have surgery. I mean, this is a man that, that had a significant injury and he's um, exhibited a, a total uh, dedication to his sport to uh, try and have this surgery done at the only possible time it could be done that could get him back on the track at Indy. Then we had to make a real important decision whether I, I'm operated on up in Indianapolis or I'm operated down here with uh, uh, George Morris, uh, good friend and, and private uh, uh, physician, excellent one. And um, Terry was fantastic and then decided to come down to Florida to assist in the operation here at Morton Plant because it was deemed that uh, if I was going to be in bed and in hospital for some time, it's far better for me just to be down the road from my children and uh, from my home than it would be to be two and a half hours away flying. And that's when uh, we had the operation down here and. Literally, I was convalescing in hospital just two days before going to the rookie test at uh, Indianapolis. The operation and recuperation delayed Nigel's appearance at Indianapolis. He was still short of full fitness when he signed on for the rookie tests. Red 5 arrived in fine fettel. Virtually a whole month of practice, qualifying and testing lying ahead before the big race, the 500, on May the 30th. First though, Nigel had to undergo the statutory rookie test, delayed especially to allow him time to recover. Mario, an Indy 500 veteran, he'd been a regular since 1965 and won the race in 1969, invited Nigel to take a gentle tour of the Oval. Red 5 towed out for the first of the rookie tests, when the driver has to prove his competence on the circuit at increasing speeds before a panel of experienced drivers. After Phoenix reasoned to be apprehensive about another run on an oval, but most of the nervous signs came from those alongside, like Paul Newman, for instance. And when the team owners were together, they looked most anxious to have the whole business settled. As Nigel set off on his first ever lap of Indianapolis, the number of people straining to catch a glimpse from the pit lane gives some indication of the importance of the occasion. The test's underway and Nigel doing everything expected of him. Among the concerned observers, Roseanne Mansell wishing him well, while AJ Foyt and Eddie Cheever were among the drivers assessing his capabilities. Excellent work out on the track, ruling out any prospect of failure. That would have been unthinkable. Eventually a successful completion of the tests and an important step along the road back to form and fitness for Nigel. Remember, he was still suffering the legacy of the Phoenix crash. I think it's the, a bit of adrenaline that keeps you going, I mean, I actually had internally in excess of, oh, I'll admit it now, in excess of 100 stitches internally. Uh, externally, just sewing me up, I probably had 30 odd more uh, big ones. Um, it's the most extraordinary set of circumstances and 
when I look back on it, it's just incredible. It's just that you've got to be so single-minded and dedicated. And I think when you have a big setback like I had in Phoenix, if you're a true racer, which obviously I am, nothing will get in your way. As long as, as, long as you can walk, as long as you can get in the car, you'll try and do it. And uh, that's all I try to do. A more relaxed Paul Newman after qualifying, Nigel to start from 8th place, pole winner Ari Leyendijk called by, a friendly encounter, a rare sight elsewhere in racing. Then of course, more photographs. This a standard occasion at Indy, yet rarely can so many have snapped the same picture so often. Over here, Nigel's been a member of the Special Constabulary for the best part of a decade. In a rare break from track action during the Indy month, Nigel became an honorary member of the FBI when he went along with Roseanne and the American TV commentator Paul Page to the FBI headquarters in Indiana. Well, there you have it. I'm a member of the FBI, so be careful. <laughs> this is what the Bureau carries as a standard <laughs> by terrorists. We're just getting a machine gun out here. <clears throat> now, I must confess, I've never shot a machine gun in my life. Before. Oh, well, we're going we're gonna to have some fun today. This is the Heckler & Koch MP5 subdued, not silenced, subdued submachine gun. How many rounds a minute does this fire? 600. 600 rounds a minute. <laughs> Compared to 200 rounds of the oval in three hours. No, several. No, no. Several went through here. <laughs> this, this was five of them. Hey, look at the state of this. Hey, look at the state of this. Now, this is an expert. Uh, Let look. me see yours. Well, look, I've got one, two, three, four, five, and then five to the head. One, two, three, four, five. At least you can see all mine are in the target. Yes. Right? I mean, I thought you meant this head. Oh, <laughs> oh well, that's 50 bucks up. Double or quits? Yep, absolutely. Okay, right. It goes too fast. <laughs> well, there is to it. Oh, this is great. And that <laughs> you watch the metal. <laughs> oh, first uh, machine gun I've ever shot in my life, and. Uh, well, normally I hope it will be the last time I shoot a machine gun. Woo. Okay. Woo. Yeah, lean into it. Lean into it. Yeah. That's, a, that's got a big kick because it's short barrel. <laughs> that's enough with that one. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that hurts. I hate it. I hate it. <laughs> that reminded me Anybody of the war in it? Phoenix, that one did. <laughs> that got a good kick. It was very uh, surprising uh, that he could step out here from his race car onto the, uh, the uh, range here and do exceptionally well. He shot as uh, well as most police officers and agents. The man is just as good a world champion here as he is on the race course. One machine gun. Paul, I hope you've it's enjoyed been a pleasure. it. It's been you fantastic. Back to the track for a first glimpse of indie images, a rich cocktail of curious, odd and enthusiastic. When you've got upwards of 600,000 people, certainly over half a million people there on race day, you've never experienced anything like that in your life. And then the ballyhoo that goes on behind everything, and the, you know, the balloons, the flybys, you know, the bands, the girls, uh, the fans, everything. It's just, um, well, it's something I've never experienced before. On the Indy grid for the first time, Nigel on the third row ready for the legendary command. Lady and gentlemen, third year agent. 
The greatest spectacle in racing, ready to roll. The crew in pit road, important members of the cast, in a major production like this. In the initial stages, Nigel tried to settle into a rhythm around the vast oval. The early laps always a stampede, a noisy confusion of speed and bravado. Around a quarter distance, Nigel was catching the leaders, Ari Leyendijk, just ahead of Mario Andretti. The Newman Haas pair engaged in a battle for second place and Nigel swept past Mario in brilliant style, the motor racing picture of the year. And the crowd warmed to the prospect of a great race at the Brickyard. It was Nigel who rewarded them. Passed Lion Dyke for first on lap 70. Nigel in famous footsteps, the first reigning Formula One world champion to lead at Indianapolis since Jim Clark led in the Lotus in 1966, the race won by Graham Hill. Into the closing stages, and the fifth and last pit stop for Red 5 due. Smooth execution by the Newman Haas crew, only one problem all day in the pit road, on the third stop when a slight overshooting of the pit box meant Red 5 had to be hauled back into position. Now 32 laps left, Nigel ready to leave the pit road after 22 seconds on the jacks. Ahead of Nigel on the track, Scott Goodyear and Mario Andretti, both yet to make their last stop for fuel and tyres. A caution flag bunched the cars together until lap 173. On the restart, Nigel gunned through the pack. 27 laps to go, and now was the time to stake his claim for victory. Impressive work by the rookie at Indy, carving through the field in typical no-nonsense style. A rookie leads the Indy 500 under green deep in the race. And he passed everybody on the outside, the inside. He didn't care where he caught them. He went by what made it look like easy. An incredible series of passes that puts the red number five at the front of the field. And he does it very quickly. Still, the leader was looking good. 19 laps left and nobody matching him for speed till the yellow went out again. Lynn St. James crawling to a halt in the pit lane, a blown engine ruining her chances of a finish and jeopardizing Nigel's ambitions. The pace car closed up the remaining runners for three laps. Emerson Fittipaldi thanking his lucky stars, he'd been given another chance. There were three complete laps under caution the stationary car was towed away out of trouble, and the race was back on. Suddenly, Fittipaldi burst past. Leyendijk then took advantage of the slipstream tow before taking second place. And in an instant, Nigel dropped from first to third, and the 77th Indy 500 built up to a terrific climax. The chase was on. 16 laps left, only 12 minutes to fight back. Ahead of Nigel, two former Indy 500 winners, experienced at this game, delighted at their good fortune. Nigel's hard charging pursuit almost brought disaster. Contact with the wall, ruling out any chance of catching the leading two. And so it was Emerson Fittipaldi who flashed towards the chequered flag first, claiming a record ninth win for the Penske team and his second after his victory in 1989. Harry Leyendijk second, Nigel Mansell third. All three averaged over 157 miles an hour. A great race, a great effort by Nigel, third on his Indy debut. Mighty impressive considering the lack of preparation time in the weeks before the race. It's my first 500 mile race. 
to say I was a little bit below par is an understatement. Uh, the crew uh, did a fantastic job. There's only one person who lost that race that day, and that was me. But there was only one person that got myself in that position to win that day, and that was me also. So, I mean, you know, on a balance, considering how everything was for me and against me, I came out of it pretty good. And if circumstances would have been a little bit different, for instance, that last 15 laps, if it had been green flag all the way, we would have won it. But um, unfortunately, um, it wasn't. Uh, there was a car that came in the pit lane that they decided to put the yellow out for. And I got jumped on the start and I didn't even know what hit me. I mean, I was going flat out down the straight and everybody was coming past. A measure of Nigel's achievement, the delight of a man who'd seen it all before, Jim McGee. It seemed unfair on the teams and the drivers, but just a week after competing at Indianapolis, they resumed opposition on the Milwaukee Mile. The schools in Florida had broken up for the summer holidays, so Nigel's three, Greg, Leo and Chloe, were able to pay a visit to Dad's office. They've seen it before, but they're always fascinated. Milwaukee in Wisconsin has hosted motor racing for 90 years, but never before had three Formula One world champions been seen in opposition. Emerson Fittipaldi, Mario Andretti and Nigel himself. The race, a 200-miler, a mini Indy, a hectic one-and-a-half-hour sprint around the four banked turns. Paul Tracy became the fifth different leader of the race on lap 83. He held on for 33 laps till he became muddled up in an incident with Lion Dyke and Fernandez. All three cars were out on the spot. The drivers escaped without injury. But Nigel was closer to the lead. Hit, Nigel, hit! Coming into the pit. Just gonna top it with fuel and we're gonna put new tires because we got about 60 laps left. Get ready. Redo your meter. This will be pretty quick. Okay. Out again onto the oval after the rapid stop and the pursuit of Raoul Bazell resumed. Bazell was setting a cracking pace, but Nigel was able to catch him. With 18 laps left, Nigel was passed and leading for the first time. A brilliant effort. But the plan to put daylight between himself and the rest of the field foundered when Robbie Gordon spun off with six laps to go. Hello, Nigel. He's running pretty good. He's running pretty good. Just keep pushing the base car. I think we can win this thing under the yellow. Looks like it's going to take them a long time to bring it in. I don't think it will. Three laps to go when the caution lifted. An Indy repeat on the cards? Oh yeah, I mean, I think, oh no, not again. I mean, I jumped that restart as, as, as early as I thought I could jump it. And yet coming out of that first, uh, the fourth turn to the, to the green flag, I looked in my mirrors and it was full of the, the orange car and yellow car of, of Ralph Bazell. So he jumped it even quicker than I did. Nigel's second win of the season. Raul Bazell just half a second behind. Great job, hell of a job. Woo! Yeah, it didn't get me that side on the restart. I know it, we had confidence in you. Thanks everybody, great job. Significantly, Nigel's first win on an oval. The pundits had said that would prove beyond him in his first season. Confirmation you shouldn't believe everything you read in the papers. And it was the 40th IndyCar win for Newman Haas. Another big trophy to grace the already crowded Mansell sideboard in Clearwater. And a result which left Nigel leading the championship by 18 points from two Brazilians, Raul Bazell and Emerson Fittipaldi. And remember, Nigel had not competed in one of those first five races. After a month away from home, time to pack up and head back to the Newman Haas headquarters at Lincolnshire, Illinois. Carl Haas has an impressive setup not far from his home in Lake Forest near Chicago. 
For most race fans, the only chance they get to see the cars is at the track. But most of the work on the chassis and engines is done at the factory. The making and the preparation of parts, the testing of engines and gearboxes, aerodynamic research and routine maintenance. There it is. It's a boy. The relentless IndyCar schedule took the team to Belle Isle Park, Detroit for round six, the third race in three weeks. Nigel had raced at Detroit in Formula One when the circuit was downtown, a rough, bumpy street course. IndyCars had moved away from racing round the block last year. For everyone concerned, a welcome improvement. An opportunity to impress the locals with some fancy footwork. USA had beaten England at football earlier in the week. Now a chance to show them we can still play the game and a few other sports as well. Nigel encouraged by the level and warmth of support he received wherever he went during the season. Qualifying went well, Nigel claimed pole position, so another point in the bag. But the race was less successful. First Nigel was delayed by a pits call following contact with Stefan Johansson, but that wasn't the major incident. A wrecker truck out to deal with a stranded car caused Nigel to run wide onto the marbles at the side of the track. And this was the result. It's extraordinary. I've been had off by a lot of drivers and a lot of cars, but I've never been had off the track by a wrecker truck. <laughs> and I've been had off the truck by a wrecker truck. That was a new experience I didn't like. It's been a whole year of new experiences for Nigel. In mid-season, he took possession of his new jet aircraft, capable of flying transatlantic non-stop. Useful when there are one or two errands to perform. Like calling into Madame Tussauds in London to spot the difference. This must be one of the signs of having made it to the very top of your profession, to have an effigy exhibited at the famous waxworks made a decent photograph. Two Nigel Mansells, when the opposition was finding one hard enough to tackle. And the occasion wouldn't have been complete without a drop of bubbly. Another honour for Nigel, Birmingham University awarded him an honorary doctorate in engineering. Roseanne and the family looked on at the ceremony, performed by the Vice-Chancellor. Further of my authority as Vice-Chancellor, I have issued the degree of Doctor of Engineering on Maurice Cowson. An appropriate award for Nigel, who began his working life as an engineer in Birmingham. Fast side this way. There was another trophy to collect at the RAC club in Pall Mall. The Seagrave trophy in acknowledgement of his outstanding achievements. Nigel a proud recipient following the likes of Sir Malcolm Campbell, Sterling Moss, Jackie Stewart and Barry Sheen. Back to work in the glorious setting of Portland, Oregon. The impressive Mount Hood, a spectacular backdrop. And the fans were out in force again. Good luck, Nigel. Good luck, Nigel. You show Emma what right in this place we have. Thank you. The fans saw a tremendous battle with the Penskis for pole position mirrored in the race. Nigel snatched pole again, but Emerson was never far away once the green flag dropped. It developed into a real dice, one of the most fascinating races of the year. Demonstration that the Penske cars were becoming a real force, improving all the time. We had a hiccup in the system from the point of view, uh, you know, Lola's uh, chief designer and that left, and uh, that left a void to fill, but we got up to speed on that very quickly. But there's no question at this period of time, the Penske came on stream very strong and as you said, was developing and uh, we're struggling at this time, probably a little bit for power and a little bit on, well, a lot on chassis. 
despite heading down the escape road and collecting a stop-go penalty, Nigel clawed his way back to second behind Emerson Fittipaldi, but ahead of Paul Tracy. Fittipaldi's second win of the season by four seconds from Nigel Mansell, Paul Tracy third. Afterwards, congratulations from one sportsman to another. Nigel went into Cleveland, the eighth of the 16 race series, leading the championship by 14 points from Raul Bazell, Emerson Fittipaldi third. A good result, vital on the Burke Lakefront Airport circuit. Paul Tracy pipped Nigel for pole, but Nigel took the lead at the first turn, held it for 15 laps before Tracy snatched first again. Mansell and Fittipaldi then became embroiled in a tremendous high-speed scrap over second place. Nigel refusing to be denied, though his car was not handling well. This was brilliant entertainment. I mean, that was just a fantastic race, and uh, I think it just showed IndyCar at its best. The only problem was uh, I didn't have the right car. <laughs> I mean, the Penske car there was, uh, I think, a little bit, if not a lot better than the Lola at that time. But I mean, uh, we hustled that car around and we had a great, great fight. And, you know, at the end of the day, I didn't win, but I was really happy with third place. And at one time, I thought I might have got second. Tracy heading for victory. Second place, the centre of attention for the last 15 laps. In one spell of six laps, they swapped position five times, like heavyweights slugging it out, said one report. But there was more class than that. Here, the masters were at work. Paul Tracy celebrated elaborately after a long race in boiling heat, but the crowd's applause thundered out too for Emerson and Nigel. At the halfway point of the season, the IndyCar series went across the border to Paul Tracy's hometown, Toronto. It didn't all go well through practice and qualifying for Nigel. Relegated to ninth on the grid after a series of problems, even worse news, the Penskis were red hot. Fittipaldi first, Tracy second. I mean, that was a nightmare. We, we um, went there and the setup we had on the cars uh, perhaps weren't quite right. I had two major accidents on the one day, um, one where I braked and uh, we were so low that the car was basically on the ground and I lost my steering. And I went straight on into the war and then, uh, you know, the second one was later in the afternoon and uh, I lost the back end again over a bump and just went straight in the outside war. But I mean, um, you know, it was, um, I look at that weekend extraordinary as a lucky weekend. Why do I look at that as a lucky weekend? I have, I've had one mechanical failure this year with a turbocharger, with a wastegate, and it was that weekend. So I mean, I could have been winning that race and had the failure. Right? We had a dreadful weekend. The car was not competitive in the race at all. It was running in ninth or eighth place, and the car failed. It actually did me a favor. <laughs> so, I mean, I look at it from a positive point of view. For the first time in the eight-year history of the race, a Canadian won it. Tracy by 13 seconds from Fittipaldi, and Tracy moved into the championship picture after his second consecutive victory. Fittipaldi took over the lead in the title race by three points from Nigel. Raul Bazell's consistent finishes kept him third. Tracy fourth, 22 points behind the leader. So on the first day of August, it was back to oval racing again. And Michigan, the second 500 miler in the series on the most daunting of all the Indy circuits. Nigel hadn't won since the beginning of June. Plenty for the world champion to consider during practice. He wasn't feeling 100% and the bumpy Michigan track surface was not making him feel any better. But even so, he was the best in the field in qualifying. The car set up perfectly, Nigel improving the previous qualifying best of over 230 miles an hour set last year by Mario Andretti. We're going into some of those corners at 240 plus miles an hour. That's intimidating and not lifting. You know, by the way, you don't take your foot off the accelerator, you go in flat. And the proof, 
right there on the onboard computer display, an average of 233.35 miles an hour, an astonishing lap, but incredibly eclipsed by Nigel's teammate Mario Andretti, 234.7, a world record on a closed course. I think the setups we have um, are such that on ovals we're very, very competitive, and then it's down to obviously racing. Um, but I mean, it was a shock to us, but I mean, the other people just didn't get up to speed. I mean, they got close to us in qualifying, but not close enough. But uh, we just, we had the jump on them in the race, that's for sure. Newman Haas cars occupied the front row of the grid for the first time in 1993. A lap clear of the rest by lap 28, then Nigel went past Mario for first place. The average speed up to 220 miles an hour with more than 200 laps to go. The Penske's already floundering, lacking power to come through and threaten. Paul Tracy the first to go with a blown engine. Emerson Fittipaldi was fighting with poor handling that required constant attention in the pits. Up front, Nigel was leading, but it was tough going. In, Nigel, in, in. Plus one lap on the field, Nigel. Plus one lap on the field. This is absolutely killing me. Aspirin was added to his water bottle at the final stop. I don't feel too good. Hey, we got about uh, 85 laps to go. You don't have to reset the meter if you want. Mario Andretti's stop was quicker, so the two Newman Haas cars were now on the same lap again. The joust continued, Nigel still suffering in the cockpit as the car thundered over the bumps of Michigan. Eventually he came through to restore his one lap advantage. A third yellow caution with 45 laps to go enabled Nigel to call in for a splash of fuel. It ensured that he could now go all the way to the chequered flag without worrying about fuel consumption. Feeling sick and with a rotten headache, he battled through to the finish. Three laps to go, Nigel, nice and easy. A splendid victory that did so much for Murad after a couple of disappointments. Nigel's first win for almost two months, his first in a 500 miler on a super speedway, and one of the best of his whole career. Uh, great job, that really puts us up in the point. Super. I had a bit of a gastric bug as well on the Friday and I was dehydrated and I couldn't eat or drink because I was being ill and sick. And, you know, I was fortunate I did the race, I wasn't well, and but I won it and, uh, you know, then when I came back home I actually had to spend three days in bed getting rehydrated and, uh, you know, it was um, it was a tough time again. Now, wherever he goes and whatever he does, Nigel Mansell's a star. dream weekends in New England for Nigel, a birthday to celebrate, and his second victory on an oval in seven days. Yeah, I mean, what a birthday present. I mean, if you've got to turn 40, that's the way to do it. And, uh, you know, uh, I just said to myself on race day, well, you haven't given yourself a really good birthday present of late, so uh, let's win today. 
It was, it was phenomenal, uh, really was, and uh, for me that was you know, very special and very satisfying because up until 10 laps to go, you know, I'd almost said, you know, you've got to settle for third place. And uh, then I said, uh, I tried to turn the boost up a little bit, and I went to sixth gear, which was the highest gear, but I thought if I could slingshot out the corners a little bit more and I was getting loose, perhaps I could just pull the extra few revs. And sometimes the trick is go in a higher gear, drop the revs and increase the boost so it doesn't pop the valve. And it worked for me, and um, as you saw, we just had an incredible uh, race those uh, last 10 laps. Oh, this is Come it! On. Mansell takes the lead with four laps to go. What a move! New Hampshire was some victory, fighting back after a delay in the pits to take Fittipaldi and Tracy, a deserved win after a race that demonstrated Nigel's daring and racecraft. A highly competitive race and a great spectacle. The result of back-to-back -back wins on the ovals at Michigan and New England, a lead of 25 points in the championship over Fittipaldi. 11 rounds completed, five to go, but only one on an oval, where Nigel was in such excellent form. Paul Tracy disappointed to have been beaten, but acknowledging another brilliant win by Nigel. And the family was there soon after for a share of the hugs from Dad. The first in line, Chloe. A fortnight after the win at New Hampshire, Nigel was at Elkhart Lake in Wisconsin, Road America. A track again unknown to him before this year. The Penske's traditionally run well on Road America. Fittipaldi has won there. Tracy held the lap record. But Nigel likes it too. Fabulous circuit, really fabulous. And, you know, if it's upgraded and there's money spent on it, it could be one of the uh, best uh, race circuits, literally, um, in the series of Formula One if they were to come over here and spend some money. Paul Tracy on form again at Road America, pole by four tenths of a second from Nigel. From the start, Tracy led the two Newman Haas cars in pursuit. But it was Tracy's day. I was just saying to myself, finish, and you know, I basically drove that weekend to finish. Second place was the best I could get uh, because Paul and the Penske chassis, the combination was just, uh, they were in a different league that, that, that weekend. We just couldn't compete with them. Um, so, I mean, just coming second again was, uh, was satisfying. Nigel 27 seconds behind Paul Tracy at the end, but importantly, Emerson Fittipaldi could finish no better than fifth. It had been a race peppered with minor crashes, 12 drivers retired. In those circumstances, avoiding trouble and taking second place was a good result. Nigel strengthening his position in the championship, stretching his advantage over Fittipaldi to 31 points. Tracy picked up a 22-point maximum at Road America and lay 38 points behind in third, with a quarter of the season left. Back again in Tracy territory in Canada's British Columbia. But it was America's race. Alan Sir Jr. winning for the first time in 15 months. That was almost another dreadful weekend. I think, uh, you know, Canada's got a little bit of hocus-pocus on me. Uh, you know, we couldn't get the car right again. I was really struggling. I almost hit the wall. I had a little accident with Willie T uh, in the morning as well, and that put, forced me in the backup car. And that weekend, uh, I don't mind admitting, I just drove for points uh, to finish, not to have an accident, but to keep going. And, you know, we got some valuable points. We finished six, we got eight points. I wasn't happy with the result, but I was happy just to finish the race. Realistically, the championship was boiling down to Britain against Brazil, Nigel Mansell against Emerson Fittipaldi. In qualifying at mid-Ohio, Nigel was held off pole position by the Penskis. 
Paul Newman, race fan and team owner, delighted to have seen his man Nigel Mansell in action at almost every venue this year. This venue being not unlike some in Europe. They're getting ready for the qualifying lap, very, very quick over here, second and third onto the short straight, fourth, keeping it in fourth now around the left hand, a very fast 160 miles an hour. Coming out, sliding out over the curve, keeping the foot hard in there, up to fifth gear, up to 180, down to a second gear, right hand hairpin. As you can see, you drop down here, you're sliding out, holding on the power, second, third on exit, fourth, fifth, and now the quickest part of the section now. Straight down the straight down here, a little bit of a kink, 195 miles an hour until you break hard, down the second gear, down the right hander, slip sliding a little bit, up the hill a little bit, over the crest of the brow, reminding me a little bit of Brands Hatch, down the hill, keeping it in second, exiting now into third quickly, then up over another rise in third, flat out, you can hear the engine revs go up, and round the next brow, third gear, over the hill again, up to fourth, 170, down the third, round here very quick now, got to keep the concentration into a hairpin down the second again, tucking in real tight, trying to keep the car in there, getting on the power, second, third, and up to fourth, and just hopefully, it might just pip the Penske's off the front row. And it did. The moment of realisation, pole position to Mansell, beating Tracy by 14 hundredths of a second. You know, the pole uh, that we got at Mid-Ohio was uh, one of the special laps you put together. It's the equivalent of some of the special laps I've done at the British Grand Prix in, uh, in Silverstone. You're going into this race with a mathematical chance of the championship. Is that weighing heavily on your mind at this point? Oh, there's no question. Um, you know, the championship means everything. And, you know, we're in pole position. We think we're in reasonable shape for the race. And, you know, um, we've just got to see how it all pans out. All systems go at Mid-Ohio. Nigel away with Paul Tracy, Emerson Fittipaldi and Raul Bazell swarming around in their mirrors. But within moments, Nigel had hit trouble in the form of Tracy's Penske. Tracy trying to run wide and cut in at the first right-hander. A severe blow to Nigel's chances. And a downcast message issued back to the pits. Thank you, Paul Tracy. I think the front suspension's all broken. Even with the race under a full course yellow, repairs had to be completed in a hurry. It was a great shame. I tried to pull right out of the corner, but he just came straight across and whacked the front end really hard. I mean, these cars are built strong, but the angle in which he hit me just bent the front suspension and the, the front uh, uh, steering arm, and uh, that was it. I mean, we were virtually out of the race. The exit was rapid, spectacular, but arriving on the track ahead of the pace car meant another return to the pits for a stop-go penalty on the restart. It was Tracy first, Fittipaldi second, Bazell third. Nigel back in the pack, but that didn't prevent him racing hard, especially when he caught up with Emerson Fittipaldi running two laps ahead. After 20 laps, Tracy leading by 15 seconds. But then two laps later, he tripped up behind Scott Pruitt and out of control, headed for retirement. Effectively, the end of his championship challenge. A disconsolate Tracy walked home. Fittipaldi the leader, when Nigel pulled one lap back on him. I think that's the strength of this series, is that, you know, even with being a couple of laps down, which is like we are, and the points going down to 12th place, it still gives you a chance to stay in the race, and and try and collect a few valuable points and you know we did exactly that we got another point and you know as it happened come the next race in Nazareth I mean that was very important. Fittipaldi's third win at mid-Ohio keeping his championship hopes alive Nigel's reward one point for pole one for 12th only Emerson could stop him now. But the guys in the pits did a great job and the car ran great it's just a shame you know that uh, Tracy uh, was as aggressive as he was, and then he I actually, I guess he took himself out. So 
all in all, we made one point. We made uh, an extra point qualifying, so we're still 14 points ahead, and we just got to go to Nazareth and uh, win the next two races. Roger Penske at Newman Haas. Such was the spirit of the season. I think the thing is, I mean, my, my strength is, is, is that I was relaxed. Um, I sort of made up my mind that everything we've done in life has never come easy as such. And I was saying to myself, it's probably going down to the last race, so just take this race as it comes and just go hell for leather and uh, try and do the best job you can. And I was probably quite relaxed, sort of saying to myself, look, you know, the way things are looking, um, you know, it's not going to be sewn up here anyway, so just do the best possible job you can do this weekend. Nigel and Roseanne at Nazareth, perhaps thinking back to the hard times all those years ago, it's all paid off. Red 5 in the garage, everything had to be just right now. No time to make mistakes with the title so close. But while everything was settled in the pits, the weather became disruptive. The heavens opened in Nazareth and the circuit was awash. Qualifying cancelled, so the grid lined up in championship order. Mansell and Fittipaldi on the front row. Meanwhile, the International Press Corps gathered to hear the announcement to cheer all America's race fans. Nigel was to stay in IndyCars with Newman Haas. For all the right reasons, we have now negotiated a, a longer-term contract which will uh, keep me in racing here at least for a couple of years and with an opportunity maybe for, for longer. And as I say, for the right reasons, and, and some of those reasons, I, I won't dwell on too many of them, is the uh, friendship, support, professionalism that the Newman Haas team has displayed this year um, literally, you know, from the mechanics to the management has been second to none. Um, it's all come out right and uh, I'm just delighted to say that uh, we've done the deal. And, um, you know, Carl's got a big eye of you. This <laughs> <laughs> morning, the championship contenders attend a special briefing conducted by starter Jim Swintal. No need for him to be concerned, these two had seen it all before. They'd race wheel to wheel throughout the season. It will be a hard race, but not chicanery. The drivers introduced to the crowd, even in the Andretti's hometown, the biggest cheer went to Emerson and Nigel. Approaching zero hour, D-Day. Anti-climax at the start, the first lap under yellow after the starter wasn't satisfied with the initial approach. Second time around, and it was race on. Nigel versus the Penskis for the lead as the green flag dropped. And the green comes out this time, as Nigel Mansell drops back a bit. Tracy comes sweeping around in the Penske cars, lead this race going into the first corner. Now moving to the back stretch. sits back in third. I was in deep trouble. I was falling backwards. I uh, actually lost another place to Raoul Bazell. Uh, but then, you know, good old English people, we regroup. And uh, I was sort of sussing out what the car was doing and, and trying to figure out why it was doing it. And then the track changed a little bit and the track came to me with the car settings. And 
Then I was able to alter a few things that we have in the car to sort of um, help the car's uh, deficiency. And then just changing a few lines and adapting a, few, a different little uh, driving style, which I do now and again, which you can do on ovals. It all came together and, I mean, that was just so satisfying. Nigel had dropped back to fourth with the car handling poorly. Then came the recovery. Passed Bazell for third. On lap 45, passed Fittipaldi for second. The first Penske to wilt under attack. That left Tracy ahead with a big lead, but he wasn't safe yet. Nigel attacked and within two laps cut Tracy's lead to nothing. Now he is beginning to challenge Paul Tracy. So here is a fight for the lead and look at him dial inside of Tracy. The crowd comes to their feet and begins to cheer as Mansell comes into the lead. So it was Nigel in charge commanding the race and even lapping Mario Andretti. Still he had problems to overcome, notably Robbie Gordon wandering about and forgetting that his Lola has mirrors. Meanwhile, Emerson Fittipaldi was running fifth, needing to come home fourth if the championship was to go to the wire. On lap 65, Nigel was called into the pits for a stop that really counted. The Newman Haas crew's work in pit lane had been exceptional all season. There could be no mistakes now. Nigel came in leading the race, refueled and retired. He went out and actually increased the gap over Scott Goodyear by two seconds. Nigel on his way to glory. And he has everybody in a firm headlock at the moment trying to get a submission. Mansell is being brutal here on his competitors. He is superb and in total control. Emerson Fittipaldi sensing as the race ran on into the closing stages that his chance of a second Indy Championship had gone. But down in pit lane, Paul Newman was taking nothing for granted. Jim McGee coolly seeing the job through to the finish. A lap to go, Nigel still forcing his way through the field, increasing his lead to half a lap over Goodyear by the chequered flag. Everyone else was at least two laps back as Nigel completed victory. He'd now won on every oval since Indianapolis. But it was a moment or two before he realised his achievement. Great job, Nigel Green! Finished. Job, champ. What a deal. Is Emerson finished? Emerson finished uh, fifth. You're the champ. You're the champ. <laughs> oh, fantastic. We won the championship. Yes. You won it. You won it. Everybody, you've just done a fantastic job. I can't thank you enough. We've definitely won the championship as well, yeah. Hey, great job, guys. And this was just the start of the celebrations. A rookie had clinched the title. Nigel Mansell, the first Englishman, the first rookie to win the championship since it all began back in 1916. Congratulations from Scott Goodyear, second on the day that history was made. Roseanne, Nigel's wife, best friend and supporter. The decision to leave Formula One for the States, now vindicated. Everyone was queuing up to proffer their congratulations. Nigel, stay in the car, Nigel. I think, uh, you know, you go through different years and you achieve different things and then you go on to different plateaus and people actually forget that, you know, we had struggled for 12 years to win the Formula One World Championship, but we did that in 1992. And now this is 1993 and we've won the IndyCar World Series Championship, so we've gone on another plateau again. Congratulations from Paul Newman, a part of this real-life drama. An incredible tale, the win first time out, the crash at Phoenix, the return before Indy, then the charge to the championship. Carl Haas, the man behind the signing of Nigel Mansell. 
Peter Gibbons, excellent work in the pit lane. <laughs> and the Newman Huss team manager, Jim McGee, the master race tactician. It was a triumph for teamwork and ambition. Nigel Mansell, the IndyCar champion of 1993. It makes you feel so proud. I mean, the feelings I have are exactly the same, if not better than the feelings when I won the World Championship last year. And I think uh, last year I had a lot of things uh, going my way. Number one, I didn't have a major accident at the second race. And I didn't have to undergo an operation during the course of last year. And there's no question we had some uh, great backing and great machinery behind us. What makes this so special is how close it was. And, um, you know, I'm just grateful to all the sponsors, but I can't thank Carl and Paul publicly enough for, you know, making a, a very, very special dream come true. And here's the picture that tells the story. The central figures at Newman Haas. It's absolutely terrific. Nigel did an outstanding job. I mean, he, he didn't worry about a couple of points. He just went for the whole thing. As they say in the States, the whole enchilada. And uh, he drove, if you watch the race, did some great moves, and he lapped the whole field with the exception of Scott Goodyear, which he had a half a lap lead on, and uh, it's great for the whole team, for all our mechanics, our engineers, Paul and I. You know, we're walking on air a little bit right now, but we're happy. And the response to this championship is, I wouldn't say double, doubly uh, what it was last year for the World Championship in Formula One, but it's certainly at least 50% more. More people have got in touch, more people have sent congratulatory telegrams and faxes, and I think um, it's just excited a lot more people for the fact that it's just an incredible set of circumstances and doing it back to back. Nazareth wasn't quite the end of an exhausting season, but the last round was academic as far as the standings were concerned. Running in fourth place, Nigel found Scott Sharp on his IndyCar debut, not expecting the champion to lap him on the inside. Then on the 71st lap, attacking again. This time an injured wrist forced Nigel to retire from the race. But the season will never be forgotten, not least by his thousands of loyal fans. So the new champion was officially declared after a season rich in drama. Strange to relate, just over a year ago, Nigel Mansell was the best driver never to have won a title. Now he's won two. A phenomenal achievement. I think the great thing is, is now I'm given the opportunity to at least defend the championship in the manner I won it. And, you know, to actually drive in number one car and to be the champion defending in the series is going to be a special occasion in itself. And this one that I'm going to certainly savor and uh, I'm going to enjoy it. I really am because uh, a double world champion, both sides of the Atlantic and, and staying with the team as great as it is with Carl Haas and Paul Newman uh, and of course all the boys and, and people behind us, uh, we'll, we'll have a good time next year.